I want to, I'm tempted to start with Mr. John Pascal because we just heard a wonderful speech from you. Uh, you've said, uh, I mean, you've of course been at the helm for such a long time, but I recently read in the uh, Financial Times that you said something about that Europe is going through a supply, uh, energy, uh, you said energy earthquake today and an energy shock or something. Um, so here we are actually that uh, India is entering into its roaring 20s, we are in 2023 and there's tremendous optimism uh, because of structural determinants to growth, high growth, relatively high growth, 7 or 8 percent, because of its demography, because of the tremendous push in infrastructure, uh, because of uh, what you said renewable plus digital. Uh, and then we hear from Mr. Rubini <laughs> and then we heard you also uh, say some grim things. So we, I'm trying to, I'm a little confused. So we want to start off with you about um, what is the medium term implication uh, for what you said. You, you mentioned that uh, we are, for the first time energy is a big problem for the world. And is this something that we are going to surmount in the next one or two years or it's going to be with us for the, for the decade? Because we in India are thinking about this as a decade a roaring 20s. It's going to be infrastructure push, high growth, huge optimism, notwithstanding what's going on right now because of Ukraine and, and so on. But then we hear you and then before you, another uh, Mr. Rubini, so I'm a little worried. Oh, you, you shouldn't be worried. The job of Nouriel is to be pessimistic <laughs> and the job of companies is to be optimistic and to find solutions. But uh, we, we dialogue all the time. And we discuss together. So, number one, we are optimistic. Number two, I'm super optimistic about India, right? And, and there is no... And you can applaud yourself, not what I just said, but there is no other place in the world where we have invested most, more than in India over the past 20 years. Uh, think about it. I mean, we... India is today our third largest business in the world, after the US and China. So it's been a massive surge, 30 plants, 5 in construction, 35,000 people present in 500 35,000 in India, right? India, India. Wow. That's, India, yeah. right? <laughs> so we believe in India, we are committed to India. Now, um, as we know, energy is at the core of everything we do. And energy also impacts dramatically the climate. So we want everybody to have a safe and reliable access to energy because we want everybody to have a decent life, but we want also energy to be clean. And I see a lot of potential here because if you look at the future of energy, it's about digitization, IoT, smart buildings, smart everything, which other countries better tool to digitize everything than India, number one. And when you think about electrification, and most of that electrification will be based on solar, you have a sun resource here which has no equivalent. So it's yeah. not all sun. I'm not ideological about that. It's, it's a mix of energies, a mix of solutions, including, as I said, hydrogen, carbon capture, and other sources. But India is extremely well equipped to do that. And I also think there is a culture of decentralization which is going into the right direction to implement a new model of energy which will apply in the future everywhere in the world. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm happy when you mentioned uh, in your speech also that India is going to do it for the first time so we have an opportunity to get it right the first time and not have to redo uh, you know, some of the other stuff. I want to jump to Mr. Ben because uh, just like you are uh, super optimistic and I'm very happy to hear that. Here is one Mr. Ben who, for whom it must be sweet music to your ears when you heard that mega, the biggest deal, air for aircraft deal in the world. So please give a hand, some 500 aircrafts. And more is coming, by the way. And your, your company, I think your fortunes are very closely tied with the aviation industry. So what's uh, your take on this uh, announcement? Uh, I mean, how do you react? Well, I think it's really exciting to see uh, the growth in aviation in India. Anytime a country goes from approximately 600 commercial aircraft to most projections are over 1,000 in five years, that's tremendous. It's a tremendous opportunity for passengers, for people. It's an opportunity for business, obviously enabled by the infrastructure and other growth in the country. Um, 
But while that's wonderful news, all four of Honeywell's businesses are strongly present here. And I think equal to uh, the, the excitement and the enthusiasm we have around the aviation sector in India, um, the same is true for the digitalization opportunity, the same is true for the sustainability opportunity that, that many others have uh, uh, mentioned on both of those fronts. So I think India has really a wealth of opportunities, and we certainly see that with the Honeywell. Uh, the growing uh, in the aviation sector, I think, is one of those, but there's also many others, I think, where it is uh, the opportunity to be to do some of the world-leading uh, uh, growth. How many, how many people do you have in India? We have 14,000 people in India. A significant number of those are involved in R&D. We have three manufacturing sites. And then we also find a lot of really effective Indian partners that actually do manufacturing for us as well. This year was actually exciting on that dimension. Uh, HAL, uh, Hindustan uh, Aeronautics, will be building uh, engines for aircraft under Honeywell license. We signed a deal with Naveen Florines to do uh, the lowest global warming refrigerant gas production here in India. So it's actually been a great market for us, research and development, customer support, and R&D. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, you know, uh, I want everybody to notice you said 35,000, he said 14,000, and these are not companies that you normally associate with. We think of Accenture with something like, I don't know, 50,000. We have IBM with 100,000, uh, and, uh, you know, so those companies are well known. But this is, it's not so well known that hardcore engineering companies are also recruiting talent. We'll come to the talent question later, but I want to actually, <laughs> this session is, by the way, about, about navigating the turmoil, but we can't start off with so much optimism, so we've got to get, get back to some more serious stuff. And the person with the grayest hair in our group with due respect, sir, to you, uh, Mr. Hans, uh, we must be concerned about, uh, you know, uh, I keep mentioning Dr. Rubini, and I can't help myself, you know, the slip of the tongue is Dr. Doom. He was called Dr. Doom in 2008. But he gave us a long laundry list of things to worry about in his speech. But one thing that comes to my mind is what is called globalization, the retreat from globalization. Do you think that we are going to see, uh, hopefully, some more wisdom, uh, enlightenment about, because all of you represent here global companies, and you can't afford to live in a world which gets fragmented and where there's more protectionist walls coming up. Well, first of all, I would say I'm also optimistic. Uh, but not because uh, the future is, uh, is just bright, because we make, have to make the future happen. So we have to work hard for it. And obviously, the people in India work very hard uh, to, uh, to build a bright future. Now, um, Mr. Rubini also talked about deglobalization. Um, and you know, when we look about uh, on globalization for the last 150 years, it has not been, you know, it has been upward trend, really. But it has not been a straight line. There have been ups and downs, and there have been setbacks. Um, and, of course, the pandemic has created uh, challenges. Now, what companies around the world are doing, despite, you know, some protectionist measures that we see all around the world, um, is they reevaluate the supply chains continuously. They look for new opportunities. Where can they serve customers better? You know, by local production, by regional production, or, or uh, you know, with global supply chains. They look for efficiency, they look for uh, low-cost opportunities, but they also look for quality. They look for risk and the challenges that are in those global supply chains. You know, and it's not just geopolitical tensions. It could be uh, an earthquake, it could be a volcano disruption, it could be the blocking of the um, Suez Canal, as we have seen. It could be um, things like flooding in, in Thailand or the uh, Fukushima uh, tsunami that has really uh, created uh, major disruptions um, over the last uh, 20 years. And I think it's very important that companies continuously reevaluate, you know, what are the opportunities, what are the risks, and they are doing this. And so we have seen over the years and decades, we have seen massive shifts. Now. At the moment, everybody talks about China plus one. And I think, you know, it's a very naive and very, um, how should I say, narrow-minded approach. I think what is really important is to clearly not be t depend on one source of supply for key products. When Europe gets 80% of its batteries or 90% of its solar panels from China, this is 
a real risk. You know, very much like you know, getting most of the cable, to, uh, cable trees for cars from the Ukraine, and suddenly right. you know you are in trouble. I think what is really important is to make sure that you are hedging your risk, that you are de-risk your supply chains, that you have a broad spectrum, that you are getting closer to customers, um, that you are certainly representative in all major regions. Um, and not try to serve everybody from, from one source. And I think that's why it's happening and that we will also see major shifts coming. India will certainly benefit, but also Southeast Asia. In our, the prediction of the Boston Consulting Group on trade flows is that, yes, trade will not come down. It will not, you know, be less trade. There will be more trade going forward, but some of the trade flows will change. There will be more trade flows to and from India, to and fr uh, from Southeast Asia, as companies really massively, you know, think about their supply chains. Yeah. So I think there is a chance for India to become a major source, um, and uh, but it also requires being open and being confident, uh, rather than trying to uh, protect itself and trying to. Um, make sure that you know india's position is not threatened because it's not threatened you have the opportunity to make it work but you have to be more open and more confident and make it work i heard thank you i heard you say that you're giving a warning that india should be careful not to become more protectionist i think but you're right about the fact that despite this so-called fragmentation actually trade is going up in fact i my favorite example is to say that at the height of the trump era president trump and the high tariffs and the tit-for-tat action, uh, the bilateral trade between the United States and China was $650 billion, including uh, delivery of a fully full cruise liner, ocean cruise liner made in China delivered to the USA. So you're right, but, you know, things are not, things are, people are not that confident. I want to ask uh, Ms. Moritz, uh, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Hans, you also spent time in Hong Kong, right? Did you, uh, the... I mean, the, I have, yes. you you actually relocated? Uh, no, no, I, I did not. I but I, I spent a lot of time in China before the pandemic. That's true. Yes. So uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Moritz, so what what would your? Uh, it's not China plus one. Maybe that's not the right way. That's not any fashionable anymore. But certainly, the big you know uh, concerns in the world are the fact that this tit for tat uh, trade war, so-called trade war, was not really about trade. It was about other things like the tech, uh, what we call the tech cold war. Uh, really, it's about, you know, President Trump talked about the, you know, intellectual property rights uh, concerns. And the world is getting it's divided into a sort of a camp where you go to China and you can't use YouTube or Facebook. And then, so, do you, are you concerned about the fact that, the, indeed, two camps are emerging, at least like a tech cold war? <clears throat> so, step back for a moment. You talked about the decline of globalization. Let's be clear that it is not the decline of globalization. It is actually a decline or perhaps a rewiring of globalization, what we've seen in the past, because this dependency of one another has never been higher. And you talked about China under Trump. China today has continued to increase in terms of its trade with the U.S. And likewise, when you try to solve for these problems around technology, around climate, around supply chain, and around other aspects associated with, you know, food, food security, and otherwise, it transcends geographic borders. So the question is going to be, how do you operate? How do you navigate that gray now, that uncertainty now? And this is where three things are really important. For CEOs, for countries, control what you can control and make decisions on it with scenario planning in mind, and perhaps the straight line budgeting processes that we've historically used are no longer valid because the world's too unpredictable and the exponential effect of that change is gonna come faster, bigger, and on more uncertainty from ever before, number one. Number two, if you're going to navigate this change, you need speed in your organizations. Speed to make faster decisions as quick as possible. So you have to take bureaucracy out of decisions because if, in fact, a trade war is coming from another country in a hypothetical, I've got to quickly think about how do I change that supply chain. I've got to move with speed. If my price points become inflation, it would be, uh, get impacted by inflation, how do I pass them and when do I pass them on to the consumers? I've got to move with speed. So speed in decision making, hugely important. And third is data. There's too many times organizations are operating on anecdotal evidence, not data facts and uncertainty. 
And that's super important, which in coming back to now the data game, to your question, it's going to be interesting because well, global organizations are going to have to learn to operate in two worlds. And you as a country have come up with what I'll call a hybrid in terms of the new approach around data, data privacy and the like, which is great because you've learned from the states, you've learned from the EU, you've learned from China, and that's your competitive advantage. And as Jean-Paul Pascal has talked about, you have a chance to come up with some new things here that serve the world without having to rip apart the old. So that uncertainty is an opportunity, particularly for India. I like this American can-do attitude, but I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot. But first, just tell us, you know, he said 14,000, 35,000. How much does PwC have headcount in India? So today we've got about 31,000 people. And wow. just so we're Big clear, for that. just so we're clear, <laughs> and some of us have been reported on this, our plan is to hire another 30,000 in the next couple of years. That's the boldness. That's what go we with. want to hear. Your president said that the aircraft orders are going to create 1 million jobs in the United States. What a fantastic thing. But I want to put, a, I want to put to you on the spot, and you, you can choose not to answer this question. What's your China strategy? China's strategy is continue to grow there as well. China has a market where our services are needed, more trust in the system and more change and disruption that's going to happen. Now, what's going to happen there is that is important to China, but it's also important to companies operating in China. So what we see right now for companies operating in China is they are changing their operating models. What does that mean? We're changing our legal structures. We're changing our operating structures. I'm going to set up an operation in China for China. I'm going to set up another operation, not necessarily in China for China, but in China for the rest of the world and move with agility so I can actually adopt to whatever may come our way. Taiwan is one risk. I don't see it as a big risk, but you're going to see a lot of volatility to it. You've got to be able to move with optionality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moritz. And I hope the people in the audience are listening to this because China, India is, is soon going to be the third largest economy in the world, and China will still continue to be the second largest economy with a six or seven trillion dollar consumer market. If you choose to ignore that market, it's to your, you know, it's your funeral. But if, I want to bring in you know, a very, very warm and very positive globalization story, which is the story of the of the vaccine. You know, people, all kinds of uh, uh, forecasts uh, from even the likes of New York Times, which said it's going to take 10 years to make the COVID vaccine, and this is a fantastic globalization collaboration across the world where the, the, the vaccine, the, the sequencing was done and the vaccine was ready and rolled out. And India rolled out, what, 2 billion doses in a short span of some 18 months. And the lady who was part of this uh, at the forefront is Ms. Sunita Reddy. So are you, uh, does that give you hope about more globalization and collaboration when it comes to healthcare? Uh, hello? Yeah. yeah. So, it certainly does. Uh, I think that without the globalization and the innovation that was happening across the world, we could not have rolled out the vaccines at the speed at which we did. And I, and I truly believe that if this were ever to stop, then India will be way behind in terms of not only rolling out vaccines, but becoming the pharmacy to the world, which we currently are. So it is a very important part of it. And I think you, uh, at this time I want to speak about the second opportunity, which is really skilling for the world. India has an opportunity now to provide medical healthcare personnel for the rest of the world. So it's not just about vaccine, but it's about creating a health, sustainable healthcare model for not just for India, but for the world. Indeed. So, uh, in fact, she talks about not just the vaccine. You know, India is the vaccine factory of the world, de facto. In fact, even the United Nations, I believe 60 percent of the vaccines are, even before the pandemic, were being sourced from India. Uh, and you also talked about the fact that skilling, India could be a big source of skilling, not just for India, but for the world, because of the demographics and the, and the talent available for teaching. Jonathan Yap, uh, you're the person who comes from a background of Ascendas. And you're in the business of taking cross-border positions and cross-border risky, and that too in a risky uh, uh, sector like real estate and so on. And now you are in, in, in venture, I, I believe, capital uh, in risky assets, right? So what, do you see any, any slowdown because of globalization or, or this fragmentation of the world? Uh, are you going to take risk? Uh, you're going to consolidate in some safer geographies and not go to the fragmented geographies in, because of geopolitics? Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate Economic Times for organizing this wonderful summit. Um, you know, I, I think behind every problem lies an opportunity. Th there will be different challenges and different opportunity at different point in time. 
Um, Capital Land Investment, um, we, we are a real estate investment manager. So basically we invest in um, whether it's in the case of India, business parks, logistics, data center, and so on. So I, I do believe there's a lot of opportunities that present itself in India. We have a lot of stats throughout the day. Um, clear one of those that I thought was interesting was that in India, we have about 850 million people who are under the age of 35 years old. Yeah. And every year, you have about 6.5 million graduates, and of which 2.2 million are in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering. So what this tells us is basically the powerhouse that I think India represent as far as IT sector is concerned. And rising middle income is, is kind of like give us a lot of hope into many other sectors. But clearly, we are moving into a world that I guess people don't know how to react, given we have got long decades of QE and there's a lot of excess capital in the system. There, there will be a risk. But I think at the same time, I, I see a lot of opportunity. I don't think it's a zero-sum game just because um, India or China or US or anywhere in the world there's issues or challenges. I, I don't see that as a zero-sum game. I do think there are opportunities in every market. But, you know, uh, I, I do want to point out the fact, that you're right, that the, the young demography, the young talent, and we had some hundred unicorns, more than hundred unicorns in the last uh, couple of years. But uh, the money that was coming in, in fact, by the way, I hope you know that we talk about FDI coming into India, about, uh, I don't know, 50 or 100 billion dollars, but increasingly it's been from in the form of private equity and, and risk capital. But now that the world is going through this tightening phase, interest rates are rising, risk aversion is rising, and the startups are feeling the pain. There's not enough money to burn, as they say, because, you know, you need money to burn. Nine out of ten startups will fail, but the one startup which succeeds will make up for the nine. Are, are you worried about this, uh, that uh, the money is drying up, risk capital? Um, we have been in India, in fact... Because of was, monetary policy, I mean. Sure. I, I just want to say that we've been in India for almost three decades. In fact, next year we'll celebrate our 30th year in India. Um, I, I guess what I've seen India over time is it's a very resilient population. Well, we, see we see, obviously, throughout the times, various issues cropped up. Clearly, capital is not equally distributed. Some have got more capital, a lot more than others. In fact, one of the observations we saw between the current situation of business, say, GFC, was that GFC, all of us felt the pain almost to the same extent. This time around, actually, there's still a lot of people sitting on capital, cash. There are others probably, like you say, are fighting for capital. But I do think that's when the challenges, it basically creates opportunity for people to be creative. And I see a lot of opportunities, that came, a lot of innovation that came out over the many years that we, human civilization, is when there are, in fact, real challenges that forces people to find solutions that are creative, that addresses the prevailing challenges we will face. So I'm hopeful, yes, there will be a period of consolidation, but at the same time, I think that's where the real good stuff will get squeezed out of all these challenges that we see. Mr. Ross, you want to... Can I just... Yeah. Can I just add... No, no. Can I just... Uh, no, number two? Okay, sorry. Can I just add, I think, you know, we got so used to very low interest rates, which has uh, driven... Um, you know, asset price inflation massively. And I think we just see some normalization. And, and we, don't should, we shouldn't interpret the normalization as, my goodness, everything is going down the drain. I think we just need to go back to some normal levels. I mean, remember when interest rates, I mean, on mortgages in Europe and North America were at 6 or 7 percent or so, then they were down to 1 or 2 percent. Now they are getting back to 3, 4 percent. So we are normalizing. And the fact that, you know, also some of the valuations, you know, here in India, but all around the world have come down, they have been completely exaggerated, you know. Now we are normalizing a bit. So let's not think you know, that normalization is the end of the world and uh, this is not doomsday. Spoken. Shall I say spoken like a true German? Because, uh, uh, but I want to come back to this inflation point and maybe uh, Mr. John Pascal, you can... Uh, uh, you see, all said and done, we are entering into a phase where, where there is higher inflation compared to the last, uh, not just last 10 years, but perhaps the last 30 years, the, the, the world was experiencing what is called not deflation, but disinflation, very low inflation. You had the money, money policy, uh, monetary policy, especially after the 2008 crisis, was abundant liquidity. In fact, the central bank balance sheets went up by 400%. 400%. GDP of the world went up by maybe 
So the, where was the money sloshing around? It was in the asset markets, it was in the stock markets. So now it can't remain hidden in stock markets, it's got to come and spill over. So we are going to experience a decade where we can't have 2 or 1 percent inflation, uh, we're going to have higher inflation. So are you worried about uh, the fact that, that this will affect your demand because you're in industrial products? In, and no, look, look I, I, I go with Anspo that it's back to normality. I mean, money has a cost, and internally in our companies, we never forgot to take uh, return rates that were much higher than the interest rates on, on the market, because you need to create wealth, or you need to create return from your investment. So that has not changed. Now, I, I think, well, it's not, you spoke before, somebody spoke about the poly crisis. It's not crisis, those are big transitions. We go from a brown economy to a green economy. And staying in the brown economy will have a cost in the future. We go from a physical economy to a digital economy. Everything is changing, and we've barely started in the world of cities, the physical world around us. We've changed the people-to-people -people interaction. We've not changed the way we live with machines, with the things around us. We go from a zero inflation to a normal inflation world, we are back to normality. We go from a completely open, where resources were not debatable, they were abundant, to a place where now you have shortages on competition for resources. Those are real transitions that need to revisit, and I go completely with what was said here. Before you had a sort of globalization, one size fits all, with the access to prosperity of more parts of the world, those parts of the world diverge in terms of culture, in terms of usages, in terms of ways of doing. And the way we've structured for the past 15 years not to be global for global, is to be local first. And, and okay. we want to be in sync with the local ecosystem. But let me bring Mr. Honeywell. Uh, you know, he's saying that we are going towards normal inflation. Incidentally, in India, we always think normal inflation is like 8 or 9%. <laughs> so for us, it's no, no, no news. We hope it remains below that. But when there is inflation, and hopefully you'll be able to raise your prices, but isn't there a concern that uh, uh, you'll have to pay higher wages? Wage inflation is, in fact, uh, uh, going to uh, be ahead of your product inflation. So you may not be able to have all of your wage inflation passed on in your product uh, is, does that worry you? And I'm going to follow that up with a question about talent sourcing. But wage inflation, is that something that worries you? Well, you obviously look at all of your P&L and you worry about all sort of costs and other things. But generally, I think um, the way to create value always is productivity. It's always increased productivity, whether it's productivity in your own company or whether it's creating products that are going to enable your customers to have more productivity. So I think... Um, it's not a significant concern, it just is a further validation of the importance of you always have to be improving your own processes, you always have to be uh, improving the productivity you get from every person that you have. And then it also is a lesson, and I think um, all of us think about this a lot, is what are the offerings that we have to help our customers improve their productivity? And when you think about you know, so much of what Honeywell does, it's about controls and automation. Well, controls and automation is a way to make every unit of labor that much more productive. And so those are the types of things I think we think about with wage productivity. There's a limit to automation because, uh, anyway, uh, I think uh, you wanted to say something about it. Yeah. A couple of reactions to the conversation we're having up here. Number one, as we move to the norm, well, a more normal world, we still have to actually deal with the perhaps sins of the past. And you have a number of companies where we are going to see increases in bankruptcy, for example. We're already starting to see that on a worldwide basis. In fact, the statistics are showing you've already got a number of 8% in terms of the bankruptcies that are coming through. Companies that can at should have not been in existence, but they survived and thrived because of zero or low interest rates, will have to go through that flushing out and actually reward good management. Now, coming back to your talent point, there's another data point that's really interesting here is when you look at our CEO survey, and I, I mentioned some of the stats earlier today, 70% of the CEOs around the world believe attrition is going to stay the same level over the next couple of years as we've seen in the past for highly skilled workers. 
Again, that's another abnormality because people are assuming we're going to have a slowing economy and therefore you're going to need less people with automation and everything else. But the reality is the highly skilled workers are going to still be in demand. And there is significant mobility as they move from company to company to company because it's easier to do that. The cost of mobility to an employer and the cost of mobility to an employee has become lessened. It's easier to find talent if you use, for example, artificial intelligence. It's easier to actually go find a job if you use video technologies to go interview, whereas before you had to take a couple of days off and, and go figure out when to do it. So this concept of labor, the power is still going to be in the highly skilled because they're going to be in demand. And oh, by the way, this is a good example where India can be a supplier of that talent to the world because when you look at technology advancements and the use of AI, the rest of the world doesn't have that skill set. And they're going to come here as they bake it into their supply chain usage and others. That's another opportunity for India as a country overall. Follow-up question. Didn't you, uh, your company did a survey and you found that 40% of the businesses that said that we are not going to be, in, in 10 years we won't exist. So this kind of is contrary to what you're saying. No, no, no. Let's be clear what the first survey says. 40% of them will not be in existence unless they drive significant change and they can no longer operate the way they used to operate. If I'm sitting in a country, some of that might be in result of the technology advancements that are going to come. And if they don't change, they're out of business. Others, like for example in China, their biggest issue is going to be the cost of energy. And how do they deal with that and pass those costs on or figure out a way to be more effective and efficient as they move off a of coal? So it's driving the change that's really important. And if you don't, you are out of business. Unless you change. I didn't realize uh, Mr. Rubin is right here, so he's facing a tsunami of optimism, you know, after his speech. Uh, I want to bring this uh, affordability and price uh, inflation to Sunita Reddy, because uh, at least in India, there's a huge concern about affordability of health care and medicines. But I must say that compared to many other countries, it's extremely affordable. Uh, but are you not concerned that uh, despite uh, universal health insurance, uh, it's still beyond the reach of uh, many people in India, and how do we make it uh, affordable? I am deeply concerned. Um, I think we provide world-class health care at one-tenth of the cost. And we're able to do this because of frugal innovation. Uh, the second aspect of it is, you know, as we, as we mature, our, uh, our, we've learned to use analytics and data and, and combine the two. So if you look at our clinical intelligence engine, we are able to provide medical advice to people at, you know, in remote locations as well. So the reach is far more than what it traditionally would be. Um, coming back to the question of Ayushman Bharat, today there are about 22 crore people who take advantage of the scheme and are covered by it. I think the government's target is 40 crore people. Having said that, I think the missing middle is a, is a huge, uh, it's both an opportunity and something that we need to solve for. And the only way to do it is insurance. To accept that insurance, you know, Indians were so, we happily cover uh, car, cars, you know, car insurance, but we think very little about health insurance. And I think this mindset has to change. You mean from the buyer's side, buyer from, behavior? From the buyer's side, yeah, if you buy a car, you're happy to insure it. But how many people think that, I believe that health insurance should be mandatory. But which way should India go? The HMO way, Health Maintenance Organization of the US or the NHS, the National Health Service of the US and UK and Canada and so on? We cannot afford the NHS way. And, and I think we have to learn from what went wrong with the NHS. HMO is a good way. We have to look at preventive health care because in the continuum of care, most of the money is spent at the end of the continuum. And in the HMO uh, method, you know, you look at prevention as well. So health insurance, HMO, looking at how we can use technology to deliver point of care where required, I think, are important. In fact, yeah, that's why I, and I'd like to think just like renewables and, and uh, digital, healthcare is a very big driver of economic growth as well. If that's a big sector, I think, in India, uh, it can generate employment as well as uh, value. Uh, Thank you for saying that. No one ever gives it that much importance. No, no, health and education. But uh, on this point, I want to, you know, we are going to be wrap, uh, sort of winding down, but I do want to bring this point, and Mr. Hans, if you could come in. Uh, one of the risks uh, or one of the challenges before the world is increasing inequality. 
And it's not just income and wealth inequality, it's inequality of access to good quality health care and, and education and other, you know, privileges. So, do you see, first of all, that as a challenge in the next coming years and what do you propose? Because I know that you also are part of the conference board and the conference board made a famous statement which is a very big departure from Milton Friedman which said that now, the, you know, Friedman said that the only social service that a corporation should do is maximize profits in a legal way without a fraud. I mean, the, but now a conference board uh, says that no, we need to take care of all the stakeholders which means it's trying to say something about inequality. Well, you know, I think um, all companies, all institutions have many stakeholders to serve. So this idea that, you know, companies only uh, serve uh, shareholders is um, narrow-minded, and I would say it's, it's, uh, we have overcome that all. You know, so if we have customers, we have employees, we have, uh, of course, the investors, but also we have the communities in which we live it's and operate. It's not lip service, right? Sorry? So I'm just provoking you. This is not mere lip service. No, no, no. It, you know, it is not mere lip service. I mean, you know, we, we heard about, you know, uh, a scarcity of talent. If you want to keep people, you know, you have to serve your employees. They are important stakeholders. And if you don't provide good uh, products and services, you don't have customers. So, I mean, you know, this discussion is, uh, is obsolete. You know, let's go with it. Now, come back to, you know, the crucial question of, of inequality. And um, I think the key... Uh, and uh, we at BCG feel very strongly about this, and I personally do, is to empower people to uh, have a good living and to address, you know, to take destiny in their own hands. I think one of the worst things is, you know, if you only think in terms of transfers, you know, so we give money away to people, um, but we don't give them a chance to really take destiny in their own hands. So health and education, you know, making sure that young people are healthy, that children are not stunted, that, you know, they go to school, that they have good quality school, learn, have good training. And I think that's one of the key elements. Um, and, you know, I think we all, you know, as companies are investing a lot in, in training and skilling of people. Uh, but, you know, at BCG and, and I, I'm sure all the others are also working in the communities in schools. You know, we have been working with the schools in Haryana to make sure that, you know, teachers do attend schools, you know, public schools, that they really do a good job, that the uh, results are better, that really all children have the chance to, to go to school. Let me ask you one pointed question. Pfizer reported uh, profits of $100 billion, was it, uh, this year? The vaccine, you know, uh, Bonanza. Oil companies, coal companies are recording huge uh, windfall profit. Would you support a windfall tax on such things? You know, I, I don't think uh, the issue is, you know, um, you know, just taxing, you know, what we call or sometimes see as excess uh, profits. I think the key is to make sure that we have a good tax base, you know, and I think, you know, countries, especially in emerging markets, have a really small tax base where um, more can be taxed. Actually, it's not the tax rates, it's collections, which is really important, Efficiency, you know, um, and that's not only true in emerging markets. We see this also in Europe and many of some of the southern European countries, you know, uh, have every five years they have a tax amnesty um, because everybody knows people, you know, don't, uh, will not pay taxes. So I, I think the key is, of course, to have a good tax base to provide good services, health and education are fundamental issues. If we do not invest in human capital, we will not address the issue of inequality. And above all, we will not be able to help people to take destiny in their own hands. And I would okay. you know, really like to emphasize this. It's not about, okay, having more handouts. It's about making sure that people can earn a good living, that they can have a good family, and that they really can, you know, um, as I said, shape their own future. Building capabilities and human capital rather than handouts. I want to come to John Pascal for the closing statements, but uh, before that, Jonathan Yap, uh, or would you like to come in now and just briefly? Oh, I, I wanted to rebound on, uh, on inequality. On, uh, we, we spoke about how do you get people to the right level of living. We spoke about energy, health care, of course. But the, your inclusion in society is education. Yeah. And there, I want to insist on one thing. Our companies, many people in this room, we develop innovation. We develop new technologies, and we have a duty to create the training to train directly young people so that they will be able to appropriate those technologies and deploy them. And when you were speaking about trade-off between profit 
on social contribution. This is exactly when it's not a trade-off, it's a convergence. We need trained people to deploy. It's in your self-interest. On, on, on schools from do it. Yeah, yeah. We never take school like provider of labor. We work with them to develop the training which will be useful in the future to deploy innovation. And I don't think we do it enough and we have to do it more. We have to help the most entrepreneurial of them to set up their own company, to incubate their own company. Um, and for the rest, you said something, well, automation has limits. It's just the beginning of automation. Just the beginning. You're going to have more productivity to fight inflation, but more so to fight labor shortage. Okay. okay. I'm going to come back to Jean Pascal because I want you to have the closing remark. But before that, Jonathan Yap, what is, uh, how much exposure are you going to take in India? Currently, we have about 220 billion INR invested in India, and we are hopeful that we'll double in the next five years. And we have been in India, as I mentioned earlier, for a long time. So we have about 26 million square feet of business park as well as um, logistics space. So we are. So you, you're finding enough uh, adequate investable opportunities. What's your take on the distressed asset market? Is there something there that you would like to look at in India? I, I, I'm not sure whether on the real estate front there really that much of distress. As I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think capital is necessarily equally distributed. And we are very used to say, look, uh, the macro indicator is this, and therefore we should do this and that. But the truth, I think, where the world is today is about macro and micro at the same time. I totally believe there will be good and bad assets at the same time. So, but we are optimistic, and we're here for the long term. So if the right opportunity come up, we'll be there to act. Okay. So, I, as I said, you know, it's really out of time, but I want Jean Pascal to have the last word because I believe you're going to step down after a, a 20 years, 25 year old career as the head of uh, Schneider. Schneider, the, the company with the German name with the, with the French accent. So, any, any sort of, you know, wisdom, what we call in India, guru, uh, guru uh, wisdom from a person who's stepping down as the captain of a very successful team uh, about the turbulent times ahead. So, your last word. What I'm saying with Schneider as a chairman, and as you said, when I go around the world, people say, Schneider, you are German. I say, it's strange you are French. I say, we German people are very open-minded. <laughs> That's uh, my, my answer to it. So, um, yeah, well, the, 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 I, I don't know. Well, the conclusion that you, well, all of our discussion, I like uh, 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 the one planet, the one family, one future. I think we are all in a global world. Uh, we are all intertwined together, and this is probably the epicenter of the fastest transformation, the fastest growth. Thank you for having us today. Thank you for taking us on board of this transformation and looking forward to the future together.